So I think for me, this has been a move for me internally. So naturally, I'm a very emotional person. I think a lot of women are, and that's why they're good at being real estate agents. So I think for me, learning to become neutral, objective, and really balancing out empathy, emotions, kindness with being objective and neutral, that's been a bit of a game changer for me. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. With thanks to our partner, Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking, and strategies to elevate your results. For more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier for your clients, visit connectnow.com.au. And to get new episodes of Elevate directly to your inbox, sign up at eliteagent.com slash subscribe. Well, hello, my name is Steve Carroll. You were probably expecting Samantha McLean, but Samantha is taking a well-deserved holiday. And I'm in the hot seat at the Elite Agent Podcast Studio here in the Gold Coast. And we've got a great guest today, Aisha Ko from McGrath. And when we were thinking about who should we invite onto this podcast, what I really like about Aisha is she has had a successful real estate career in the UK, which of course is where I'm from. Also is kicking huge goals at McGrath down in Geelong and has has been able to transfer her skills from two different parts of the world. She also, believe it or not, has time to donate a lot of her time in building homes for homeless families in Cambodia, I think, Aisha. So, Aisha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Steve. What an honor and absolute pleasure to be here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've deserved it. One of the things that I learned at Elite Retreat, which was an event a couple of weeks ago on Hayman Island with about 200 real estate leaders, one of the speakers talked about Never say you're lucky in life, you're fortunate. And we're both fortunate to be on this podcast today because we both work extremely hard and we've got to where we've got to because of hard work, not through luck, Aisha. And look, for the audience who don't know you, and everybody will know you through the McGrath Network, and most people will know you within Victoria, but for those people that don't know you, Aisha, a bit of an icebreaker question or two. What's the story behind your Facebook profile photos? Why those pictures? What should we take from those photographs, Aisha? Gosh, that's a really good question. So my main profile photo is a picture of me standing outside of a sold sign from a house that I sold recently. And That one was a really, really, really special journey that I went on with that client. We all know that at the moment, the market isn't the best it can be, and it's a bit challenging. That property sold for an absolute record for the area over the last, I think, five years. So the highest price that had sold in that area, I think, was about 2.255, which I sold a couple of years ago. And we managed to achieve 3 million for this one. So it was just such a highlight of my career this year. And the family that I sold for are just the most beautiful family. We had a few challenges throughout that campaign. So it was just a really special moment. So that's me putting the soul sticker up and yeah, just celebrating that moment. And then I think my cover photo is, so in my cover photo, there's a picture of three women. We all work in real estate, but we don't work at the same company. So there's Claudia Michaels and Cherie Hay. And we have formed this group of female real estate agents outside of the companies that we work for, that we all network, we've become really good friends, we do training together, we give each other referrals, and we just support each other when we don't always have the people around us necessarily in our offices or things are getting too busy. We've actually got this external network of amazing female agents yeah, we're just all there for each other and it's just blossomed and grown. And we've got about five people in that group now. 
So yeah, so that's what a great well idea. Tried. <laughs> and let's just talk about Spotify for a second, because I'm sure when you're building these homes for homeless families in Cambodia, long old days in the sunshine, I'm sure you're listening to plenty of music through headphones. But if you had a playlist on Spotify that told a story about who Aisha is, what would be the opening track and why? One of the songs I absolutely love that I will never get sick of is Imagine Dragons, Whatever It Takes. That's a song that I used recently on one of my reels to show what I had done for the last 12 months, all my sales to promote that. I really love that song because if you look at the words, one of the sentences in that song is everyone is circling, is vulturous, is negative, but you still got to do whatever it takes. And that's so relevant to our industry. We're always going to deal with toxic things that are happening, difficult clients, jealous agents, and it doesn't matter. Like you still got to do whatever it takes. Just push it aside and keep going. So that's like my pump me up song. Yeah, I listen to that in the gym on the way to work. I just love it. Excellent. Well done to you. And maybe this is a question I should ask of your friends, but your friends aren't on this podcast. (laughs) You are. So let me ask you, what's a quirky or unconventional habit you have that has contributed to your success? And you've been a very, very successful real estate agent in two different locations. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that, Steve. This is a really difficult one to answer because if you ask, as you say, my friends, I think they'll be able to answer that a lot better than I would. But thinking about this, I've had a lot of immigration issues in Australia and I was founded by my visa to companies that I was working for in the past. So yep. the habit that I had previously was being a yes person, a people pleaser. All I wanted to do was keep my employer happy, keep going, just say yes to everybody and everything, which actually caused a lot of burnout for me and didn't fill up my cup. So I was, I was really in survival mode. But since I've got my permanent residency and my citizenship, my new habit is being able to look at something and go, is this going to make me happy? Is it going to fill my cup and fill my soul? Is it going to be good for my business and my community? And if it's not, saying no. So my new habit is actually saying no to things that are not good for me and good for my soul. And I think that's become more evident over the last three years. Yeah, excellent. Now, Aisha, I'm still on a bit of a high because I facilitated an MC'd elite retreat a few weeks ago in the beautiful Hayman Island. We had a couple of hundred real estate leaders and agents there. Now, the theme was genius moves. And we spent two days looking at studying genius moves that business leaders had made that created opportunity, created success, and so on and so forth. So need to ask you this question, and this is about you. What's a genius move you have made in your life professionally or personally that you look back on and you think, wow, I'm glad that I made that genius move because that's really shaped me as a person. What would that be? I think when you say move, I think of two different things. I think of a physical move from one town to the other, but I also think that you could correlate that to a move that you've made within yourself as a person. I think with this one, I could probably talk about my immigration stuff and all the places I've moved to, but we'll be here all day. So I think for me, this has been a move for me internally. So naturally, I'm a very emotional person. I think a lot of women are, and that's why they're good at being real estate agents. So I think for me, learning to become neutral, objective, and really balancing out empathy, emotions, kindness with being objective and neutral, that's been a bit of a game changer for me. There was one thing that I learned recently, it was probably about a year and a half ago, I was doing some self-development work. And one thing I learned, which has been an absolute game changer, is the 90 second rule. Do you know what that is? No, explain. Okay. So really quickly, 90 second rule. 
is a known fact that as a human in our brain, we've got 90 seconds of reaction time. So someone's rude to you, someone says something you don't like, or they've offended you. Our natural response is to react to that and fire up. But if you wait for 90 seconds, it's a proven fact that our brains will dissolve that feeling within 90 seconds. So just by waiting for 90 seconds to then respond to something is an absolute game changer. And I do wonder in our industry how many agents have actually reacted and responded in those 90 seconds, how much money they've actually lost because of that, how they've handled that situation. So I think for me, that question is really about doing the moving on the internal stuff and learning how to maneuver yourself. I love that answer. And one of the reasons I love that answer is one of the great speakers at Elite Retreat was a fellow English person, Aisha, from (laughs) Manchester. So he didn't speak like you. He didn't speak like me. A guy (laughs) called Paul McGee. So Paul McGee is known as the sumo man. And he showed this great slide, which was E plus R equals O. So E is the event that you happen to be in. And that might be a happy event. It might be not a happy event. You've just been made redundant or you just had a parking ticket or whatever. That plus the response equals the outcome. And I love that. And what you've just said is, well, look, hang on a minute. It's probably E plus 90 seconds plus response equals outcome. So yeah, good stuff. It's really important if you get you know, a knocking email from a buyer or a difficult client on the phone, it's really important to just go, hold on a second. Do you mind if I just call you back in a moment? I've just got an appointment or a meeting. Go for a little walk, think about it, come back and then respond can be the way you respond in those first 90 seconds versus how you respond afterwards is going to be completely different. And that's going to help elevate your career. Love it. So let's go on from that. I put a post up on Facebook yesterday to say that I was interviewing you today. And I said that you've got more trophies in your trophy cabinet than the great Real Madrid football team from Spain. There's no doubt that you've been very successful. But what's a failure or setback in your career that when you look back has turned out to be a blessing in disguise? How did it shape you and how did it shape what you are as a person and your business. So a setback or a failure? I think this one's a really easy one for me. I had a 10-year struggle to get my permanent residency. And every time I tried to get my permanent residency, the government would change the rules and I'd have to move. So I worked in Melbourne for six years as a real estate agent, Dockland, South Bank, CBD, was just about to apply for my residency and then they said no more real estate visas in Melbourne. You've got to leave. At the time, I was dating a guy in Perth. We'd been doing long distance for about a year and a half. So we had to make a decision. It was like, right, I've got to either go home or I've got to move to Perth and go on a partner visa. So I didn't want to leave my community. I didn't want to leave my clients. I'd built up this amazing career very, very quickly and I had to literally just leave it all behind get on a plane within 30 days and move to Perth. Got to Perth, completely different market. It was challenging. No one was buying. I'd gone from selling like 10 houses a month, properties a month to one a month. It was new rules, new legislation, new ways of doing things. It was very, very challenging. Really struggled in Perth. Loved the area, loved the location, but really struggled with those differences and trying to compete against these long-term agents that have been there forever and a day. Did manage to get through it, managed to get some sales under my belt. Then I found out that I was looking at this situation and it, it wasn't working with the guy. It became very toxic and I was pretty much bound to his visa. So he had full control over my situation, which was really, really difficult. So I had to, again, find another way How am I going to stay in Australia, not be on this guy's visa where he's in complete control of my situation and still work in real estate? How do I make that happen? So I went to a lawyer. The lawyer said, you know what? The only thing you can do now is go regional. You're going to have to go regional. 
You can't do it in WA because WA has got a lockdown on regional visas at the moment. Again, another rule that came in to stop me from staying where I wanted to be because I was quite happy to stay in Perth. I actually wanted to stay there and try and make it work. But the government had pretty much said to me, here's a list of postcodes. You have to pick one and you need to move within 60 days. I'd never been to any of these places before. I was Googling all these postcodes. I was like Mildura, Wangaratta, middle of nowhere. We've probably got like only a thousand houses anyway. I was thinking, how am I going to sell, list and sell a lot if there's not many properties in those locations? So I called a friend of mine in Melbourne. I said, look, this is a list of places. Where do you think I should go? And I think I spoke to about two or three different people who worked in real estate and they all said Geelong. I said, you need to go to Geelong. Geelong is the place you should go. It's got more property there. It's only an hour from Melbourne. You still got your support network where you can jump in the car and go and see your friends. It's only an hour down the road. Never been to Geelong before. Left everything in Perth, got on a plane, moved to Geelong, rented a room from a complete stranger, hired a car, got a job at an agency in Geelong, which is not the same one I'm working for at the moment, and just made it work. And I was miserable when I first got to Geelong. I was being put in properties that were two or three hundred thousand, graffiti on the outside, you know, bullet holes in the front door. Like I'd gone from selling these beautiful luxury apartments to beachside properties to these absolute terrible rundown homes thinking, what have I done? And at that point, I was thinking, God, do I go home or do I just make this work? And I stuck it out. I made it work. I just had to get to the point where I got my permanent residency. I stayed at that agency for nearly two years to get my PR. And as soon as I got my PR, I then was approached by one of the directors at McGraw and thought, yeah, that's where I want to be. But I can't come to you until I've got this permanent residency. It was about a week after that conversation where it just happened to turn up out of the blue. And looking back, that was not a personal failure, I guess. It was just a very challenging time. And I wasn't super successful at that time. And I did, I guess, feel like I'd failed in myself because I wasn't selling as much as what I used to. But looking back, I was so consumed in this like mental jail of this visa stuff that I wasn't giving the best version of me to my community. And I was just trying to get by and survive. But look, as soon as I got that piece of paper, we were actually in the middle of a lockdown in COVID. So ironically, the whole world lost their freedom and I literally gained mine, even though I couldn't leave my my house. It was the most bizarre thing. And it was like a switch changed and flicked on and it just absolutely changed my life. I was not bound to anything. I could be myself. I could say no to stuff. But it took me 10 years of that to get to that point. So yes, it's been a really tough journey, but I'm out of it now. And I've been a citizen for two years and my career's completely changed since I got that piece of paper. Fantastic. Give us an idea of how many properties you're aiming to transact, sell in 2024, Aisha. So last year, I did 42 sales, which isn't a huge amount, but my GCI was quite high because of the type of properties that I'm selling. So every year in Australia, I've been doing 500,000 GCI. I had this wall that I could not get over. As soon as I moved to McGraw, as soon as I got a coach, as soon as I invested the money into the coach and moved companies who had better systems and training and processes, I actually doubled my GCI. So next year, I really would love to double that. I would love to get to at least 60 to 80 sales. That's probably would be my goal. Wow. You should be very, very proud. So well done for that. That's tremendous. I'm going to ask you a question, which actually was the icebreaker question at Elite Retreat. And it's a pretty challenging question, but let's just see how we go. So what's a topic that very, very few people, if anybody, are talking about right now that will be studied by historians in the future? And just to give you a bit of head start on that question, I got asked that question and I said, 
the topic of the day that cars as we know it no longer exist. So I actually think in the future there'll be a day where there'll be no cars that people actually get in and drive because it will all be driving driverless vehicles. So very, very few people are talking about it right now. But I think in years to come, historians will reflect on that and talk about those days when we'd be uh, in traffic with a steering wheel and people will laugh. What's your take on that question? What would your answer be? This is a really hard question. Gosh, would it be amazing if we could predict the future? I was actually watching something recently, and I don't know if you've seen it, Steve, but in China, they've got these cameras on the streets and they pick up your facial recognition and they can literally tell where you live, whether you've been in trouble with the police, your ID, your date of birth, your employment, everything, even if you just walk past one in the street. I mean, I think this is a way, way long off from this, but I think the way that technology is going at the moment, I think we're heading towards, and this is a wild thought, but this is just a conversation I had with someone recently, that if that came to Australia and you had cameras out in the street, I think there'd be an absolute uproar. But I wonder if we're sort of heading down the route of having that character bond, like a points where you have almost like a virtual ID attached to your name and your license plate and your number that anyone can see like the police or your employer. And it tells you whether you've been arrested or not, your employment status, maybe even things like community involvement. Do you give back to the community? How good a character you are? I don't know. I think that's a bit of a wild idea, but I think it would not necessarily be a bad thing because, for example, if you've got a woman who's going on a date with someone, they kind of want to know who that person is before they go and meet them. So from a security perspective, you know, you might even have that on a dating profile or something like that or virtual ID where you can't come into an open house unless you show your ID. We know your character or even a female going out to an appraisal. I think something like that is not that far away. I think, you know, maybe 50 years, 100 years with AI and everything, it could be something like that. Yeah, really interesting because I spent some time working in Dubai and Dubai is one of the safest places in the world as a man or as a woman, to walk around because the technology they use to keep the street safe is actually incredible. So that's using technology as a real plus. I can see a day where real estate agents are open for inspections and as someone walks up the pavement towards the front door, you're notified on your phone, this is Mr. and Mrs. Carol, this is the position they're in, this is what they're looking for. And the meet and greet will be laid on a plate for an agent. I can definitely see that happening. And I think that's super important from a safety aspect. At the moment, it's not compulsory for buyers to show ID. I actually had a scenario not that long ago where a guy came through my open home and I asked him for his phone number. And I said, oh, oh, hi, let's call him William. Hi, William, how are you? And he's like, how do you know my name? I said, oh, I can see that you've been through another open a few weeks ago with one of my colleagues, because it's all obviously recorded. He said, oh, I haven't. No, that's not me. And I said, oh, yeah, it is. Look, you know, showed him. He said, that's very intrusive. You can't have my details. So I said, well, I'm thinking in my head, you're just about to walk through someone's house, their home. Isn't that intrusive? But you yeah. don't want to give me your details. So I really think technology can be scary, but I think from that perspective is actually really important that we do implement something like that in the future. You come through the open home, we just need to know who you are, your name, your number, where you live, whether you're in a position to buy or not. For security, not just for the agents, but for the owners and their homes. I think that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Good thinking, good thinking. Imagine, Aisha, you're having a conversation with yourself 10 years from now, and you are a supersonic real estate agent, incredible success. You're having an amazing life. You've got amazing network of friends and you're having a conversation with yourself 10 years from now. What are the key decisions do you think you need to be making in 2024 
for that to be happening in 2034? I think for me, so I'm in the process of building a team at the moment. I've recently employed a remote professional full-time through the Wingman Group. Amazing. So that is getting to a point now where this remote professional is doing all of my admin, all of my non-dollar productive admin, which gives me back so much time into my business. I think the key thing for me next would be to build an even bigger team. I actually saw a real estate office in Melbourne recently. I was watching a video that someone had sent to me and this office has the perfect habitat for agents to thrive. I mean, it is extreme. And that's now. They've got a gym. They've got healthy food and drinks available 24-7 for their agents. They've got networking rooms. They've got a team hub space. They've got individual offices where people can go and focus and do their prospecting calls. But in addition to that, they've got showers. They've got Places you can go to and get ready for work, like makeup stations for the women or the men, whatever you fancy. But they've also got uh, Zen rooms, so places where you can actually go and read a book or take time out, like the 90-second rule we were talking about earlier. You've just had a really difficult conversation. Go and sit in the room, in the Zen room. It's got water features and air diffusers. I thought, wow, that's actually amazing. And that's today. Building something like that would be an absolute dream. I mean, it would be to have a huge office where you could have this environment where you're really showing your staff, you know, I care about you. I want you to perform as a person and as an agent. I care about your well-being and I want you to be happy and healthy because ultimately those kind of agents are going to be the ones that do the right thing by the clients, perform better and are happier and nicer people to engage with. If you're a happy, healthy person, you want to interact with that person. You've just got this attraction about you, you know. So I'd love to build something like that in the next 10 years. That would be my absolute dream. Fantastic. And if you could collaborate with any figure, alive or dead, inside real estate, outside real estate, to help you coach you on that journey, who would that person be? I've probably got about 10 different names for you, but I'm going to try and keep it short because I love Matthew McConaughey. I think he is just incredible. I've read his book, Green Lights. I got an opportunity to ask him a live question at Eric a couple of years ago. Just such an incredible human, the way he thinks, the way he talks. I would love to have him come in and coach my team on resilience, what matters, what doesn't matter. Another person I really love that I'm watching a lot of their videos at the moment is Alex and Layla Formosi. So they're an American couple and they build businesses over in America. They would be incredible to team up with. They're just so forward thinking and not your typical sort of business people. I mean, Alex is always in his gym gear when he's doing his videos, but the way he speaks and what he says is just so impactful. And Layla, his wife, is just as amazing. So if I could have those three, I think that would be a recipe for a huge success. Fantastic. I love listening to your dreams and aspirations and the journey that you're uh, going to be going on. I'm going to be watching very closely. <laughs> Let's see if we can work that with, eh? So you've been working in the real estate space in Australia for, what, six years now? I had 12. 12. 12 years. Wow. So I must, must have misread. So That's if you right. could rewrite the rule book for the real estate industry here in Australia, if you could rewrite the rule book, what's one rule you would change or just get rid of entirely? This is probably more of a, a government thing. The first thing I do is eliminate stamp duty for a few years. I think that's really important at the moment with what the world's going in. I think We've got a lot of exceptional agents out in our industry, but we've also got some ones that are taking advantage of the community, not doing the right thing by the clients. So I think it's really important that when you get accredited as a real estate agent, I think we should be re-accredited. I think agents should be going back and redoing their licenses or having a top up. I think that should be compulsory. I also think that 
agents shouldn't be able to sell their own home. I think that's a rule that we should get rid of because the buyer is ultimately dealing with the vendor directly. I've seen that scenario in Geelong a couple of times and I think it makes the buyers feel pretty uncomfortable. So I think we should just eliminate that too. Yeah. Maybe you should run as an MP because clearly (laughs) you've got plenty of time and you can make those changes. So just a couple of questions to finish off with. What's a common piece of advice in the real estate industry that you hear at conferences or you hear at podcasts or webinars that you completely disagree with? And you can be as controversial as you want. No need to mention any names, but what would you say? So I think agents need to stick to giving real estate advice and not giving mortgage advice or conveyancing advice and vice versa. Conveyancers need to not give real estate advice and mortgage advice and mortgage advisors need to stop giving real estate advice to their buyers. So I've had an example recently where a buyer has been getting real estate advice from their mortgage broker and coming to me and saying, this property is not worth this much because of this, this, and this. Now, that mortgage broker has basically coached the buyer to come back to me and provide that conversation. That mortgage broker has never been to any of my opens in that area, and I'm the top sales agent in that area. I've sold 40 houses in that location. And I just think if you've never been to the opens there, you've never bought or sold in the area before, you're just going off this data on the internet. You've not actually physically walked through these properties. I just think it's these mortgage brokers giving real estate advice. They really are just there to be getting the loan for that person and guiding them through the financial process. They shouldn't be coaching the buyer on how to buy the property. I think if you want to go and get buying advice, you go and employ a buyer's agent. That's what they're there for. So that's what I would say to anyone is, We've got to have good people in our network to make a deal go through. Got a good conveyor, good broker, good agent. But everyone stick to their own lane. Just do what you need to do, and don't go to each other for different advice because it's so wrong and it shouldn't be happening. Yeah, makes sense. So, just quickly, can you tell us about the amazing work you do uh, in Cambodia? How you find the time to do it, I don't know, but that's for another podcast, another time. But briefly, what do you do and and why do you do it, Aisha? Thank you, Steve. I built a house in Cambodia, gosh, it was last September last year, so about just over a year ago now. And actually, I was asked to go on this trip. It was already pre-planned. And I thought, you know what? I've never picked up a hammer before. I have got no experience in building at all or renovating or painting, but I just want to challenge myself. I want to do something really wildly different. So I said yes, and I actually nearly cancelled before I went because I thought, oh, my gosh, what am I getting into? You know, I'm leaving my clients behind for a week. They're not going to get their properties opened by me. I've got to get someone else to do it. So there was a lot of anxiety about going and I I was very, very close to counselling, but I thought, you know what, I need to go and fill up my cup because that's just as important as the work I'm doing on the ground here in Geelong. So I went there and honestly, I had the best week of my life for a long, long time. It was incredible. I met all these people that I would never usually meet in my normal day-to-day job. And when you're forced into this situation where you have to work together and it's quite a challenging situation, you create this bond with people and it's it's actually a really beautiful thing. I've got these friends now for life that I would never have met if I hadn't gone to Cambodia. But also giving back to this family. So we actually met the family before we got there. They were a mum and dad and two kids, and they were living in a metal shack that kept falling over every time the monsoon came. And so pretty much homeless, just trying to find shelter. So we raised us $30,000. We went over there and we built this house in five days, like the whole thing. And it had electricity, had water, had a kitchen, had a bathroom, everything. It was actually amazing. And giving the key over to that family at the end on day five, and watching how incredibly happy it was. Now, this place wasn't a mansion. Like, it's not so, like some houses are selling. <laughs> like, it's literally like a wooden house. 
with the very basic infrastructure. But giving this key over and watching their reaction really changes you. When you see that live and you get to be a part of that experience, I think we get so caught up in the modern day world where we're chasing the next shiny thing. Let's get the newest car. Let's get the newest iPhone. Let's get the newest Louis Vuitton bag, whatever it may be. That stuff's not important, really, is it? You know, when you look at life properly, you're not going to die if you don't get that Louis Vuitton bag. Your life's not going to change because you went and bought that bag. But giving back to someone and giving them a home, a place that they can live in, that they can tuck their children in at night and go to sleep safely and giving them shelter from the monsoon, I really don't, I think that is the greatest gift. You you just can't beat that where you give somebody a property. I'd love to do it in Australia. I'd love to do it in my own community. But obviously the pricing is a bit different compared to some of these third world countries. So our next one is in Indonesia and typical Aisha style. I came back from Cambodia and went, that was amazing. That was easy. I had the best time. I don't just want to build one house now. I want to build a whole village. Let's do it. We can do this. So setting this wild, huge goal that I have, which is what I do in my life, set these unachievable goals and then just chew like mad to try and get there. I decided to come back and project manage a five house build. So five houses side by side for five chosen families, which are chosen through a non-for-profit organization who are on the ground in that country. They go around, they interview who's the most vulnerable family in this village and they pick the, the five families. So we're now building five houses in Indonesia in June and I need about probably 40 volunteers and I've got about 12 at the moment. So really trying to recruit some more people for this volunteering trip because I really want to get there and actually fulfill this dream of five homes. And, you know, if we only have 12, we might only be able to build one or two. We're not going to do the whole five. So that's my goal. I think a lot of this comes from my mum. My mum was a humanitarian for UNICEF. She worked at the Khmer Rouge in the 1970s at the refugee camps, which is in Cambodia after the war. And she's done a lot of amazing things in her life. She's travelled the world, worked in lots of different countries doing this sort of work. So I think it's just a natural part of what I've grown up with and seeing my mum do that has really touched me and I think I don't think there's anything better than giving back. I think everyone should do it at least once. That's great and so well articulated. John McGrath is very fortunate, not lucky, fortunate to have you in his team. Can I just finish off with one final question? So, And I can get away with this being a bloke in his late 50s, so no one will take offence at this. But the real estate industry, and it is changing, some great people are doing some great work to change it. But the real estate industry in Australia is very much full of males, middle-aged males that have probably gone a bit stale. You're obviously a very career-driven real estate professional that has got great goals. If you were addressing a group of females of similar age to you, Aisha, on how to build a successful career in real estate, what one piece of advice would you give them? I think the first thing I would say is believe in yourself. Don't let anyone else bring you down. We get a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of toxic stuff that happens out in our industry. Not to care so much about what other people think because you're always going to have people that don't like you, they're jealous of you, they're going to gossip about you and it doesn't matter because that's just their opinion. That's just showing you who they are. It's not actually true. It's not showing you who you are. That's just a reflection of that person. So don't care so much about what other people say and what they think. Block it out. Focus on your goal. Implement. Keep going. Women are very powerful people, I believe. Obviously, credit to the men too, because you're all amazing. 
But I think women have a natural way of being empathetic and kind. But that's actually not enough to be a good agent. You've got to be assertive and strong. And it's a perfect balance between the two. So it's a dance between the empathetic, human, kind, and strong and assertive, and knowing how to really mix the two together whilst not giving a shit about anyone else and what they're thinking. If you can do that and align yourself with other people around you who are already doing that and just keep going, this is a long term game. We've got agents who've, you know, been in our industry. They give up after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, gets overwhelming, and you can't be a successful agent if you are going to give up so early. So just never give up. Believe in yourself. Beautiful. Well put. The Australian real estate industry is fortunate to have Mm -hmm. someone like you within it who does such a great job on the tools uh, as a real estate agent, but then grabs other tools to build homes (laughs) for homeless families overseas. You're a real credit to your mum, to your family, to the industry. So well done, Aisha. Thank you for being part of this podcast. It's been great chatting. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you and look forward to catching up again soon. Great. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Elevate podcast. With thanks to Connect Now. To stay in touch with all things Elite Agent, sign up for our daily newsletter, The Brief, at eliteagent.com slash subscribe. 